Hello and welcome. Today we are kicking off the first in a series of videos about assembly language programming for the COCO. Uh, today we're going to get into my environment and workflow. So we'll be talking about the editor I use, the assembler, and the debugger. And we're even going to get a little bit into time travel debugging. Uh Before we get started, I just want to let you guys know I am not an expert in COCO assembly language programming. I have never worked on a very large program. I've done a lot of small programs, and when I was younger I started but didn't finish an assembly language game. Uh, but lately I've been getting back into it, and I've been rereading this awesome book by William Barton Jr with good humor and lots of sample code. It's a really great way to introduce yourself to 6809 programming. So if you don't have this book, I recommend it. Uh, just go to Radio Shack and I'm sure they'll have plenty still in stock. Um, but today we're gonna take a look at the environments that I've been using and maybe there are better ones out there. So if you are an expert, if you've been doing a lot of large programs, Feel free to add into the comment section anything that you think that I missed or misstated or should have talked about. Uh, but let's take a look first at my editor. Edtasm. Okay, let's take a look at why I don't actually use this tool anymore. In its day, it was fine and it was all I had and I didn't know any better and I was happy with it. But there's so much better stuff out there now. Uh, so let's look at the first reason why you don't want to use Edtasm anymore. You can't fit very much on the screen. You're limited to 32 by 16. And then when you want to go editing it, you can only do it line by line. Ah! Ah! And if you think you want to use copy-paste, well, think again. I don't know how I lived without copy-paste before. I did, but I can't anymore. But actually, this isn't quite deal-breaker stuff. I could probably get by with just this, but I'm going to show you the real deal-breaker right now. Here I'm in Zbug. I've run the app until I got to my breakpoint. I do a step. And what's the next thing it's going to do? It's going to jump to a subroutine in the ROM. You think Zbug is going to let me go into a subroutine in the ROM? No! It can't do it! It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's not supposed to be able to do it. Uh, but I want to do it. That's how I learn about the ROM as I step through the ROM. So goodbye, Edtasm. For editing, I use Visual Studio Code and I use this plugin to highlight the 6809 assembly. The plugin is called 6x09 and it's by Blair LeDuc. I am sorry, I am sure I mispronounced your name. Uh, but I like the plugin because not only does it do the kind of highlighting you would expect, it also lets you know when you make a mistake. So, for example, you can clear A and you can clear B but the highlighting tells you you can't clear X, so it kind of assumes mm, you must mean a label here. So it's pretty nice. It's not just labeling, it's not just coloring by like where it lives in the file, but it actually knows the list of uh, opcodes and what to expect. So that's for editing. For assembling, I use LWASM. And before I show you that, I just want to show you this one last line here. When you're using LWASM, if you put an end opcode at the end or pseudo opcode, that's how you can tell it where you want the execution address to be. So this, as usual, tells you where the, the start address should be. So the, the very first instruction is going to be at 3F100. This will know to write into the postamble of the, the binary block on disk 
that the execution address should be 3F100. If you don't do this, a simple exec will not work after you load M. Uh, for more information on the binary file format, check out my modding Donkey King part two video and you can scan through the, the index until you find that chapter that talks about the binary block format. So to install LWASM, I ended up having to build it myself, and I followed the instructions from this blog. So this is Subetha Software. This is Alan Huffman's blog, a great blog, lots of cool, good info. And it was through this that I was able to get LWASM built onto Windows and runnable. I'm not going to run through these steps, but basically I did the SIGWIN way. I installed SIGWIN, uh, ran the command to build it, and it worked great. Um, I'm able to run it outside the SIGWIN command prompt, so if you prefer, you can do that. I was able to run it within and without, but I just prefer the regular command prompt because it has those features that I'm used to. The other thing I took from his blog is that Hello World program. So the program that you just saw, I just shamelessly copied it from him. The only thing I changed is I added that end statement at the bottom to set the execution address. So the, on the LWASM command line, these are the three parameters that were recommended from that blog. I think there might have been another one. These are the ones that I use. Uh, the 9 says 6809 chip. B says to create a deck B compatible format, so B for deck B. And the L says also print a listing to the standard out so you can see what it did. So if I run this, I find out that I'm not in the right directory. So if I run this, it shows me the listing, it shows me the, uh, the machine code that it assembled, and I'm ready to put it onto my disk. And for that, I use, as you might have guessed, DECB. Uh, the Toolshed project is what contains the DECB, and uh, I have another video on that. If you go back and take a look at my using DriveWire to backup Floppy's disk, you can scan through and find info about the DECB tool. And this is the command line that I use to copy the resulting bin that came out of LWASM onto my virtual floppy disk. So here, dash two says a machine code type. So the type that it will appear on the virtual floppy is a machine language program. That says the format is binary. And this says if it's already there, rewrite it. So let's go. Nice and fast. And now I'm ready to run it. So let's go ahead and run that under the debugger and see what we get. Another blog shout out, by the way, it was Glenn's blog that turned me on to using MAME as the debugger. Um, uh, Glenn's blog is another amazing blog. This person has done some incredible work transcoding old arcade games to the 6809, so you can play them on the Coco 3, like they are the exact same thing. So there's a lot of really cool information on Glenn's blog. Uh, also known as Nowhere Man 999. So I got it from this entry where he's talking about several things. He's talking about LWASM and he's talking about MAME and using the MAME debugger. Uh, once again, I'm kind of shamelessly just rehashing a lot of the things that he mentioned. There are a couple command line parameters I'm doing slightly differently, um, but generally speaking, if you go to his blog, you're gonna basically learn exactly what I learned. So highly recommend it. And here is the command line I've been using for MAME as a debugger. Um, so I start with Coco2, that's my hardware. This took me a long time to find. So this uses the quote natural keyboard for MAME. Uh, as you of course know, the keyboard on the Coco arranges things in a way before they really got standardized. So for example, they, there's one key for the number two and the double quote, whereas on a regular keyboard, your double quote sits with the single quote, and two and the at sign sit on a separate key. And I had found in the main UI that there is a way to change the keyboard mappings, but you have to change two and double quote as a unit. So you can change both of those to another key, but you can't change just one until I figured out that there is yet another setting called natural keyboard layout. 
So once I found that, then I started looking to see if there was a command line equivalent, and there is. So now I just use this, dot dash natural, and then the keyboard works the way I would expect using like a regular PC keyboard. Uh, dash window opens it up in a window. This allows me to use the main UI to configure things as necessary. This sets F12 to be the key to bring up that configuration UI. And finally, dash debug. We arrive at dash debug. This says that when I run main, everything should be running under a 6809 debugger. And even more finally, Dash Rewind enables time travel debugging, sort of. And we are going to see what that looks like as I run my session. So let's go. So I will run the batch file. That brings up MAME, which is emulating the COCO. But it stops before the ROM is fully initialized. And that gives me a chance to go into the debugger to set breakpoints. So since my code starts executing at 3 half 100, I will set a breakpoint at 3F100, and then I'll hit F5 to go, and that allows the Coco to boot up. I will load my code. I will execute. And now I am at my breakpoint. So as a reminder of what my code is doing, uh, it's loading X to point to the message, and then we have this loop one by one characters from my message go to the screen. And uh, that's it. And then when it's done, it returns. So what I'm gonna do is pop up a memory window and point it at the screen. So the screen, oops, 400. So the screen starts here. In fact, you can see the little disk extended color basic, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it has what we have. And so I'm gonna start stepping over if you go to the debug menu, you can see your keyboard binding, step over, step into. So I'm gonna do some step overs and start going through. And as I do this, you can look on the left pane and you see the registers are updating as I go through. And if you look in the window, you will see that slowly the message as it gets uh, filled up into the registers gets then pointed to the screen. So uh, let's do a little time travel. Time travel lets us go back. So that key binding is control F11. That's rewind step. So if I do control F11, watch this thing. It goes up, 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 up. And as I do it, take a look at my screen. So it keeps track of the whole state of the world, including all of the memory. And so it knows that as I go back in time, this changes. And then I can go forward again. I can step forward with F10 and it fills it back up again and the registers update each other, which is very cool. Uh, if you've ever debugged and it took a really long time to get to the point of the problem, but then you step like one step too late and you were like, oh my gosh, I have to start over again. Uh, time travel debugging is such a godsend because you just step back. So if you step forward too much, you just step back and you're back where you wanted to be. But I gotta come clean with you. This is not fully time travel debugging. And I will show you an example. I'm going to set a breakpoint at the return. So I click here, I do F9. That sets a breakpoint. So keep in mind, so far we've gotten hello printed, and once we get here, it'll all be printed. So I'm gonna do F5 to go to the breakpoint, and now we've got our hello world printed. Um, now I'm gonna go back. Take a look at this what, as I go back. Control F11, one step. You see what happens? We went back in time a lot. We didn't just go back up one instruction. What we did is we went back to the last rewind state that was saved. So what we're really using is a feature called rewind, not really full on time travel debugging. And what this does is it automatically saves a state every time you step. And that means every time you step, you can undo that step. You can rewind back up a step. But if you hit F5 and go, 
then it's not going to be setting save states for every instruction it passes over. It's just going to set a save state the next time it breaks in, so the next time it hits another breakpoint. So uh, you don't get the full treatment like you would get with full time travel debugging, but there is a way out, and that's the trace command. So what you can do is set up a trace file, and that actually will, in a text file, write the state of whatever you want. Registers a certain area of memory for every single instruction that's executed, whether you step it or not. Then you could use that trace file to take a look and see what happened. Like, let's say, for example, you set a breakpoint somewhere in your code and you're wondering, wait, how did I get here? And you don't know how you got there, so you didn't know like to set a breakpoint earlier to step up to it. You just want to know, how did I get here at all? You could use the trace file to let you know and then read that trace file and set a breakpoint on one of those earlier instructions that the trace file figured out that you got to. And then that's how you can sort of do your pseudo time travel debugging backup as needed. But anyway, that that covers it for my uh, introduction to MAME debugging and what it looks like, how you set it up, and the time travel, pseudo time travel portion that it has. I hope you learned something. And if you found anything incorrect or incomplete, please feel free to fix me in the comments section. Thanks for joining, and I will see you next time.